Hey everybody, I pray you can hear me. I think I'm gonna say that every time I get on here because the last thing I'm gonna do is get on here and talk and nobody can hear me. Goodness. But I pray that you're all doing well tonight. I give glory to God that we made it to tonight. My goodness. Let's see here. Hey everybody. Evening, everybody. Hey, Dakota, how are you doing? That must mean you can hear me, girl. That's all I needed to know. That's all I needed to know. That's all I need to know. Oh, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Whew, okay. Let's get ourselves together. Good evening. Hey, JL. Oh, man. So I want to go ahead and get started because I'm so scared I'm going to go over. Do you know one of my biggest fears is to be like the Apostle Paul in, those, in that Bible story where he's preaching all night long and he's preaching so long that the boy falls asleep and falls out the window dead. That's literally like my biggest fear ever that I'm going to be like praise God hallelujah and somebody's going to get so sleepy they're going to fall out and pass out dead like I can't so I want to make sure that I stay on time tonight I know some people have kiddos going to school in the morning you can't be staying up either it's a school night um and speaking of school I just want to say a quick prayer over our children and over the teachers um Lord, we just come before you because you are our father, because you said we can come boldly before your throne. Lord, we come before you lifting up our children before you, lifting up the people that have, have walked in their calling and their anointing to educate these children, Lord. We lift both of them up right now before you, asking that you would guard their hearts, guard their minds, guard their eyes, guard their ears, Father. Lord, let them not be influenced by anything wicked, Lord, but let them be guardians and gatekeepers and and torch bearers of the light of Christ, Lord. I pray, Lord, that our children are covered. I pray, Lord God, that you keep them from any danger or any harm, that you would expand their minds for understanding, expand their minds for socialization and grace and love with one another, Lord God. But most of all, that, that these young ones, these little ones are not led astray, but they are led on the path of Christ. I pray for our teachers, Lord. I pray that you would give them patience and endurance, Father God. When so many have said that they are done, when so many have said that the situation is too dim, that the situation is is too hard for them to do, that they aren't making enough money, that it's not doing it, it's not doing that. Those that have returned back another year, Lord, we pray that you would give them strength and endurance and favor, favor with their administrations, favor in their classrooms, favor with the testing, Lord God. And we just pray for a successful year. My baby's not going to school, Lord, but let them be all these babies at home. Let them act like it's school and be blessed here too. In Jesus name. Amen. Okay. So I guess I should start with our homework, right? I did it. I can't show it to you. There's only one thing that I need to say anyway. Um, our homework for my last Bible study was what do you know you need to sacrifice? And if you really are bold, if you really are on fire for Christ, we were supposed to go and ask the Holy Spirit, what else, Lord? So if you've got your, your homework done, amen to you, girl. I'm not no teacher. I ain't, I ain't checking no papers. Mine only has one word, control. I need to sacrifice control. I need to say everything I do stems from this desire to have control. And if I would just let go and let God, the man made a whole song about it. If I would just let go and let God, I probably would be a lot further in this shift than I am right now. I'd stop doing these little these little bitty steps and I'd start taking bounds and leaps for God. So for me, it's control. I don't know about yours. If you feel comfortable sharing your business, drop it in the chat so that everybody can see what it is that you know you need to sacrifice. You know you need to sacrifice. Okay, so it's from that point that we're going to pick up with this Bible study which we're calling turn around. Now, I want to start this with a different perspective of the gospel. And I pray that you be patient with me. If it starts to sound like a U.S. history class, I'm sorry. 
but it's it's really important and, and monumentally important that we get a good foundation right so i want to start with the gospel the good news right but i don't want to just talk about it in the way that we've heard over and over and over again i want to talk about what the gospel looks like in the spirit i want to talk about what the gospel looks like in the spirit realm okay and there's a reason for doing this because remember we're shifting and right now we're shifting on faith that means we don't see it I know you've probably heard it before, but a lot of things, not even a lot of things, most things, all things happen in the spirit before we ever see them tangible in front of our face here on earth. So understanding what the gospel work is in the spirit will give us a really good foundation for understanding how we need to turn today right now, right? So obviously if we're going to start with the gospel, we have to start from the very beginning. And then when I say the beginning, I mean the first line of the good book. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Now, I want you to shift your perspective just a little, just a little, because we're not going to talk about the gospel that's centered around you. The, most of the time when we talk about the good news of Jesus Christ, it's all about you, girl. It's all about me. It's all about God loves you, and he wants you, so he sent Jesus for you to come back because you are that valuable, you, you, you. And I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying that there are more there are more perspectives to see. We have a multifaceted God, right? So we can't just keep being comfortable with the one piece of understanding that we have. We want to look at this thing from all corners, right? So I want to take the gospel not from the perspective of you, but I want to look at the gospel from the perspective of the kingdom, the kingdom of God. You see, the Bible gives God many different titles. They call him the, the uh, commander of, of heaven's armies. They call him El Shaddai, all these Hebrew names. They call him uh, Jesus, God with us. But there is one title that God bears. It's called King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Why? Because God is a king. He's not just a king. He's the king. He is the one and only. He is the ancient of days, the ancient king, right? And that is because God created the first kingdom. Let's go back to the scripture. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You can flip through that Bible all you want. I want you to try to find me an account where God specified how he created the heavens. How did he do it? Does it tell you how he formed the angels? Does he tell you how he set up his throne? Does it tell you any of that? I ain't found it. I ain't found it. I don't know where it's at. I don't know where it's at. It's not there. Maybe you're reading in them apocryphas and those secret books of knowledge. Girl, I don't have all that. I didn't see it, right? God created the heavens and the earth. And then the scripture goes on in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 to describe how God did it. How he separated darkness and light. How he caused the waters to separate. How he made the expanse of the sky, the birds, and human beings. It goes through all of this, right? But that means that God created heaven. And you know, heaven is where God's kingdom is. You'll see in the New Testament, it talks about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven. That's where God's kingdom is. And I don't know if you remember anything from your history classes, girl. We don't do this in America. We didn't do this. But other, other nations, other kingdoms, right, have a history that once they have their, their small piece of territory, they expand out. They conquer more territory. But see, our God is not a man. Our God creates territories. That gave me chills, girl. He creates territory. So God expands his kingdom that's in heaven and starts building a kingdom called earth. He creates it and it's void and without shape. And being the potter that he is, he begins to add shape to it. He starts to separate things. He starts to set things up. He starts to make creatures to live in it. Right. He's a creator. He, our God is a creator and he creates, he extends his kingdom, not just in the heavens. Now we've got something tangible. Remember, God is spirit. So his his kingdom, we can't see. So now he's down here creating an expansion to his kingdom. He's expanding. Right. And because he's king of kings, he makes a human. He makes a man. He picks up dirt and puts his breath in him. Remember, he says, let me make it. Let's make them in our image. And he gives him dominion and authority to, to rule and subdue the earth. I know it doesn't sound like we're talking about the gospel, but we're all up in the gospel. Let's just keep going. He gives him dominion and authority to rule over the earth. 
Now, remember, God had already made the heavens. He created the heavens and the earth, but the earth was void, right? So now we're focused on earth. But in the heavens, there was all kind of stuff going on. There was an angel named that we're going to call the enemy, that slew foot devil, the serpent, Satan, that had already had a tussle with God in the heavens. And I want to read to you about it because we're getting into the gospel from a kingdom perspective. So let's start with hmm, Isaiah. Let's start with Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah writes this. He said, how you are fallen from heaven. Who is he talking about? Oh, day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. Hmm. Above the stars of God, I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. What is going on in heaven? Let's read another scripture. This one's a little bit longer. Let's look at Ezekiel 28 verses 12 through 19. I'm going to read it. It says, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. Uh, crystallite and emerald and topaz and onyx and jasper, turquoise and beryl. Your settings and mountain, mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Though your wives, through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. Hmm. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God and I expelled you, expelled you, remember that guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. The heart became, your heart became proud on account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. By your many sins and dishonest trade, you have desecrated your sanctuaries. So I made a fire come out from you and it consumed you. My God. And I reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who were watching. All the nations who knew you are appalled at you. You have come to a horrible end and will be no more. Lord Jesus. It's a lot of stuff going on in heaven. That's Satan, y'all. That's Satan. And not only is it Satan, what happened in heaven, but it's also prophesying about his end. You will be no more ashes. The nations are laughing at you. You're trash. That was about the end. But all of this is talking about Satan. Now, if we pick apart what's in those scriptures, what we're seeing is Satan had a heart filled with pride. And he decided in his heart that he was going to ascend above God. That's what he decided. He had made up his mind, I'm beautiful, I'm full of wisdom, what's stopping me? I will ascend above heaven. I will ascend before, I will be like the most high. Now look here, I just told y'all, our God is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So in Satan's heart, he decided, I'm gonna be a king, to, I'm gonna be the King of kings and Lord of lords. But our God is not to be trifled with, he's not to be played with, he gets expelled expelled we're about to get into some real old timey english definitions but that's all right he gets expelled exiled get out you're not here okay so satan shows up in the garden satan shows up in the garden where adam and eve are little mini kings and queens remember god made them in his image he's a king and he gave him authority to rule and subdue and have dominion over the earth what what an English or maybe a, an older kind of term, you would send it, we call it a messenger, or maybe um, in England in the old times, they would call him a duke or, or a baron or a, whatever you want to call it. This is his, his kingly representative in his new territory. This is his kingly representative in his new territory. I just created this space for myself. It's a part of my kingdom. And here I've appointed a king. Rule over it in my image. Rule over it with the authority I've given you. Rule it. Subdue it. Fill it up. Make it yours. 
because I've given it to you with my authority and my image, right? So here comes Satan. And you know what's crazy? Satan wants to be a king without a kingdom. He wants to be king of kings and lord of lords, but he can't create anything. He's not a creator. He is created. So now you have a wicked, prideful enemy of God who has a heart to be a king with no kingdom. So what does he do? He goes to try to usurp or to take or to or to infiltrate and bring into his own God's kingdom. That's what he wants to do. That's why Satan shows up to Eve. You know, it's so crazy because I used to always think, why does Satan, everybody makes Satan sound like he's just, he has no sense. Do you know what I mean? Like Satan hates you because he hates you. Satan hates you because he's just a hateful hate. He just hates and hates, hates. Like it, like there's no strategy. He wants you to go to hell with him because he's miserable. No, he wants you to go to hell with him because he's building a kingdom. Because he wants to be a king. And in order to be a king, you have to have territory. And in order to be a king, you have to have, you have, to have uh, citizens. But if you can't create them, you have to go steal them. Isn't that, isn't that what you have to do? I don't know. Sounds like what you have to do to me. So now we have Satan popping up in the garden to tempt Eve with his goal being, I'm going to get me some territory. I'm going to get me some territory. I'm going to get me some territory. That's what he decides. Come on. Come on, foot soldiers. I'm going to get me some territory. So he goes to Eve. But see, he's a serpent. He's sly. He's slippery. He doesn't say, hey, you want to join the kingdom of darkness? What kind of offer is that? I'm living here like our pastor, Pastor Doug, was talking about last Sunday. I'm living here naked with my man eating grapes, petting lions. Why would I want to change the kingdom that I'm a part of? Why would I want to do that? Come on, Pastor Doug, he's defeated in Jesus' name. Why would I want to do that? Why would I want to do that? So he starts to he starts to plant these ideas in our head. Can I tell you something? Satan used Satan used God's tactic on Eve. Satan had just learned a lesson that if you disobey God, he will exile you. If you disobey God, you who had a home in the kingdom will have no home. Isn't that what the scripture just said happened to Satan? That when he found all this wickedness and pride in his heart, God said, get out. God said, get out. So Satan comes to Eve and he says, ooh, ooh, ooh. Maybe, maybe I can, I can plan it in her mind to question God enough that she will expel herself and I'll have myself my first kingdom citizen. I'll have myself my first kingdom citizen, my first citizen, my first human citizen in the kingdom of darkness. If I can just get her to disobey God like I did, then he'll have to be true to his word and he'll have to kick her out like he did me. So that's what he does. He goes to Eve and says, surely God didn't say that. Surely he just doesn't want you to know what he knows. He's, he's just, surely that's not what he said. You won't die, will you? And Eve, poor Eve, gets tricked because she doesn't realize that she's a pawn. She's a pawn. That she's literally standing in the middle of a choice between two kingdoms. She doesn't realize it. She was created as a kingdom citizen of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of light. This is where she belonged. This is where God placed her and Adam. This is where they belong. They were kingdom citizens. But here comes Satan and she doesn't even know that what he's offering, what he's tempting her to do is abdicate her authority, is to abdicate her access, is to abdicate her, her access to God and, and to the garden and his presence. She doesn't know that. So, come on, it's a seed of doubt. It's a seed of doubt. She falls for it. She falls for it and gets Adam to eat the apple or eat the fruit and we all know what happens then. Now look here. After that, God comes and he says, what are y'all doing? And he begins to curse the serpent and curse Adam and curse Eve. 
but it's in the curse of the serpent. And I want to read it to you. It's in the curse of the serpent that we hear something very strange. It says in Genesis 3 verse 14, it says, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than any livestock and more than any wild animal. You will move on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. Man, if I could have said that to some of my enemies when I wasn't saved, you're going to eat dust for the rest of your life. He says in verse 15, I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. Okay, he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, so now we see here that God is talking directly. <laughs> Come on, that's, that's the, the devil is a lie. We see here God speaking directly to his adversary. I see that you've come to my kingdom to steal from me, but I have something to tell you. I'm going to put a hostility between you and this woman and the seed she gives birth to. Now, why is she, why is God talking to the woman about a seed? Women, women don't carry seeds. I don't have no seeds. I have eggs, but I don't have no seeds. Why is God talking to the woman about a seed? Okay. He says, the seed that she carries are going to come against yours. That's all he can do is lie. They're going to come against each other. And he's, you're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. <laughs> he's going to crush your head. And then God exiles Adam and Eve. He exiles Adam and Eve. Now, this is this is why I went this route. I want to explain it to you because I know we're doing a lot of background. I know we're doing a lot of background. This is why we went the route of the kingdom because I want you to understand the gospel from an, a cosmic perspective. Why? Because what we're going through right now, I want you to understand is one, it's not just you. Two, I want you to understand that if this is going to be the this has been the path for every single person, every single soul that has come into life on the earth since Jesus rose and ascended back to be with the Father. This is the same route we're all taking. That's why we want to go this route. You have God who created Adam as his own representative in his new territory, and you have Satan, a, a landless, moneyless, personless play king who who exalted himself. And we know what the Bible says about those who exalt themselves. They fall. He exalted himself. And so he comes to what God has created to try to steal from God and make his own kingdom. But God is not to be played with. God creates a promise even in that moment. Even in that moment. Speaking not to the woman, not to Adam, to his adversary. And he says, if you think I'm going to suffer this. You've got another thing coming. See, there's going to be a seed and you won't know when and you don't know how, but he's going to come and he's going to crush you. And that seed is Jesus. So now what you have is a kingdom of light and a kingdom of darkness. And you have men and women who were a part of the kingdom of light, now a part of the kingdom of darkness. See, the thing about a king is whatever they say is law. Whatever they say is law. That's how kingdoms work. If the king says, y'all ain't having no more babies, guess what? Y'all ain't having no more babies. You'll go to jail. You'll, you'll, whatever the punishment is. When a king, a king owns everything in his territory, the water belongs to him. The sky belongs to him. The people belong to him. That's how kingdoms work, right? He has authority over all of those things. I wanted to explain it this way too because the Holy Spirit was telling me that there's this one particular question that bugs people when it comes to the gospel. And the question is, why does Adam's sin apply to me? Why do I have to be born into sin? What does Adam's sin have to do with me? I didn't do anything wrong. We'll get to that. It's the principle of a kingdom. Think about it. Anybody who's born in America is American. You don't have to do anything for it. You don't have to sign any papers for it. Since my mama was in America and she, I came out of her womb when I popped out, hey, hello, I'm American. Now, if my mother gets exiled, if she gets kicked out and has to move to China, every child she has in China will be a Chinese citizen. They will not be American, even though she's American. 
that's going to be a Chinese citizen. I hope I'm making sense. So the reason why Adam's sin applies to you is because every human being has come from the seed of Adam. And Adam switched kingdoms. When Adam disobeyed God and got exiled, he switched kingdoms. Now, every single one of Adam's kids belongs to the kingdom of darkness. And the kingdom of darkness operates in flesh. The kingdom of darkness does not align itself with the righteousness of God. That's why you're born into sin. That's why. That's why no matter how hard you want to be or no matter how much English you learn, no matter how many cultural customs that you learn, if you are born in China, you're Chinese citizen. That's just what it is. And that's the same for hum humanity. Because we come from the seed of Adam, we are born into the kingdom of darkness. But God set aside one. He sent a seed of the spirit, born of the spirit, not Adam. Y'all, isn't this crazy? Born not of Adam, but of the spirit, born by Mary, born out, birthed by Mary, to give us a way back to the kingdom of life. Jesus Christ is the pathway. He is the pathway between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. Not only is he the pathway between those two kingdoms, he's the gate. He's the gate. So here we have all these people in humanity born in the kingdom of darkness. That's why the Bible says, oh my gosh, we've been waiting. We've been waiting. The Old Testament Prophecies have been waiting for him to show himself this servant that will redeem us back to God. Where is he? It's Jesus creating a path right back to the kingdom. Because when we got put in the kingdom of darkness, how you know how to get back to light? You've been turned out. You, you operate in a whole different kingdom. What do you know about fine? It's like Hansel and Gretel without the bread cons. How do I get back here? The only way that the Jews knew to get back was through childbirth. They were like, we know a seed's coming. So you need to have a son. Is this the son? Is this the son? Is this the one? Is this the one? That's how they knew they were going to make it back. They were waiting for Jesus. We've got him. He is this pathway. Pathway between the two kingdoms. That's why we're born. We sin. We're born in sin and shaping in iniquity because we are born into a kingdom of darkness. But through Jesus Christ, the good news, this way made. He says to his disciples, my God, I'm off, I'm way off. He says to his disciples in John 14, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. None can come to the Father except through me. You won't find this path back to God. You think there's so many people in the world that say, I'm gonna, I'm on a journey to find God. I went to the top of the mountains in Ecuador. I went to the Salt Lake City of whatever. I went to the casinos. I went to the this. I went to the that. And I'm going to find, baby, you can't find God without Jesus. You won't, there is no path back to light without Jesus. How can someone give you the way except the one who descended, which is the one who ascended? Come on. Key word is through him. Not only is he the path, I'm the way, I'm the truth. I'm the life. None can come through the Father except through me. This is the gospel from a kingdom perspective. So now we're seeing how there is this path called Jesus Christ. It's a path of righteousness and it's narrow. It's narrow. This path back to this kingdom of light. And so now we have all these people in the kingdom of darkness trying to figure out life, thinking that they found something good. Just like Eve. Eve thought she had something good. Can I tell you what Eve said when he put that seed of doubt in her head? This is what she said. It says in Genesis 3 verse 6, it says, The woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was delightful to look at. What a pretty, what a pretty fruit. And that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of the fruit and ate it and gave it to Adam. We think, we think a lot of things. We thought, we thought we had it. We think we have it figured out, not even realizing. Man, I'm on my nose, but praise God anyway. So now we have Jesus Christ creating this path. But let me tell you something about darkness. How do you get out? Can you remember the time in your life where you were doing stuff and you just knew that you knew that you knew you were right? Like you knew that you knew that you knew you were right. One example for me is being petty. And, and vengeful 
How could it not be right if somebody comes for me and I come back for them? How could that not be right? That's got to be right. That's got to be right. I thought I knew what I was doing. I didn't know anything about a path of righteousness. So how do we get back? How do we get back? What's the first step? Can I tell you that it has everything to do with our Bible study from yesterday? It starts with sacrifice. Yesterday, last Wednesday. It starts with sacrifice. I want you to remember the story of Abraham and the conversation that we had and how God started his interaction with Abraham with sacrifice. He said, go from your father's house. Go from the land, from your land. Go from your relatives. It started, the conversation started with sacrifice. Why? Why is it that the first step to finding the path back to God, getting on the right path with Christ, why is the first step sacrifice? Why? Because sacrifice indicates the position of your heart. Sacrifice is what indicates what position your heart is in. In order to sacrifice, your heart has to first be in the right position. And I want you to think about it. I want you to think about it. If you're married, it takes a certain position. You have to take a certain position to sacrifice for your husband. Come on, because we have to lay it down. We have to lay it down, Mary. Come on. You have to take a certain position to sacrifice. For mothers with kids, right? Once you become a mom, it's so weird, but it changes the position of your heart where now all of a sudden you're willing to sacrifice things that you were holding on to with your nubs. I got nubs, you probably don't. But you were holding on to with your fingers. Come on, come on, JL. We have to strip ourselves of everything that is in us. It's... It has to start with sacrifice because sacrifice indicates your posture. It indicates what your what position you're in, right? And a sacrificial heart posture starts with repentance. Now that word repentance has a lot of weight because a lot of us, our brothers and sisters in Christ, have spent a lot of time yelling it down the street. Oh, we getting down to the nitty gritty, Dakota. A lot of our brothers and sisters in Christ be yelling out the windows, repent, repent. Don't nobody know what repent means. What do you mean repent? You mean say sorry? No. That's not what repentance means. Repentance doesn't mean say sorry. Repentance means to change your mind. Repentance means to change your mind. Remember I was telling you that in order to sacrifice, your heart has to be in a certain position. That means you have to change your mind. See, when you have kids, you're willing to sacrifice all this stuff because it changes the way you think. Once you see that little person looking at you like, hey, I'm going to keep crying till you help me. Hey, I'm depending on you and nobody else. Hey, once you see that, it changes the way you think. And for people whose, whose mind doesn't change, we look at them like, how can you become a father and your mind not change? How can you become a mother and still be so selfish? How can you, why? Because it's these situations, these circumstances change the way you think. When you get married, in order to go from two flesh to one, you got to change the way you think. I had to change the way I think. Not just how I feel, girl. The way I think, the way that I see things, as a man thinketh, so he is. I had to change the way I think so that I could be it, right? It starts with changing how you think. It means changing your mind. That's what repentance means. So when they say repent, they say, hey, baby, you need to change the way you think. You need to change your mind. Renew your mind. You need a change in the way you think. That's it. <laughs> I feel like I've said it enough, right? So... In order, sacrifice reveals where your heart is, right? It reveals the position of your heart. Remember, in order to shift, it means a change in your position, your tendencies and your direction. That's what it means to shift, a change in your position. So when God tells you to shift, you thought it was just, come on, get on this train to glory. Come on, get on this train to prosperity. No, you need to change the way you think. You need to shift. You need to change your position. My position towards what? The way you think. You can't move unless you change the way you think. Hey Amen. I'm sorry, y'all. I feel like I hit that point really hard. So, why do we have to change the way we think? What's so wrong with the way we think? 
We have some of the brightest minds in, 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 in all of Christendom and all of whatever. Some of the brightest, smartest people in the world. Why do they need, you're saying everybody has to change the way they think? Yes, because it's the way we thought that got us here. It's the way that we thought. It's the way that Eve was thinking that got us switching sides. Remember the scripture in Genesis 3, 6. She thought, well, it looks good for food. Well, it it looks good. It looks delightful to look at. I, I think it looks good. I, I think it I think it's desirable for with what do you what do you mean? How can you think all of those things when the word of God said it'll kill you? I don't care how juicy a peach looks. I don't care how juicy a peach looks. If you tell me it's poisonous, all of a sudden that thing that looked desirable, I have no desire to have. No thank you. No thanks. If you tell me Ooh, girl, come on, come on, Cynthia, stinking thinking, stinking thinking. If you tell me this fruit that's so beautiful and delightful can make me have mind reading powers, but you tell me, but it'll kill you in the process. I'm like, girl, no, thank you. It was our thinking that elevated itself above the wisdom and the knowledge and the commands of God. That's scripture. I'm not going to tell you which one. You have to look it up. It was any kind of thought that elevated itself above the knowledge of, and the wisdom of God. If God tells you that the tree is going to kill you, the tree is going to kill you. What you thinking for? What are you thinking about? Come on, pastor. Come on, Judge. She said, replace my thoughts with your thoughts, Lord. That was my prayer for like a whole year. Pastor Doug said, worms will be on that tree. <laughs> Dang old red bulls. Come on. Now, look, don't come from the people's stuff, Jason. Don't come from the people's stuff. <laughs> honestly so how we have to repent we have to change the way we think because it's thinking that got us switching sides when the enemy came in with all this rah 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 it was the way we think that got us all twisted up in the game so we need to change the way we think so my first question to you tonight does the way you think cause you to sin against God does the way you think cause you to sin against God? Hmm. I could just leave right there and we'd be done. I mean, quite honestly, that's enough conviction for tonight for me. Does the way that I think cause me to sin, sin against God? I'll never forget. I'm going to share this one story. Xavier and I, uh, something had happened in our family and they caused me and Xavier a lot of stress and a lot of trouble unnecessarily, unnecessarily, right? Come on. Your thoughts are your navigation of your life. Come on. Caused us a lot of stress, a lot of strife. And I was filled with rage. Now, I'm a, I'm a sweet Southern girl. I don't have no rage against nobody. I was mad. And literally, I'm sitting in my head wrestling with the holy spirit the holy spirit is saying be silent i said i'm about to go beat the brakes off of them god be silent i'm about to barefoot knock them out jesus be silent and i was wrestling because the way that i was thinking would have caused me to sin against god because i was gonna cave their head in and I don't even know anything about caving heads in. And I was going to do it because of the way I thought. Because I said an eye for an eye. Oh, you want to mess with my family? I'm coming for your head. And the Holy Spirit is saying, don't. Stop. Wait. Pray. And I'm saying, Holy Spirit, ain't nobody got time for that. Does the way you think cause you to sin against God? Come on, Pastor Christie. Unnecessary drama. Cynthia said, in which do I think that caused me to sin against God? Lord, reveal it to me. Positive thoughts, positive results, negative thoughts, negative results. Pastor Doug just preached on this. Change your attitude. Adjust your attitude. The way you think cause you to sin against God. Now, I'm about to get in your business, and I want to I wanna apologize right now. I'm saying this in love, but I'm, I'm, we're going to be real straight up with this. What are the barriers that are keeping us from changing the way we think? There's three barriers. Three, and I'm going to try to get through it very quickly. <laughs> three barriers that are causing us to that are hindering us from from changing the way we think the first one you judge yourself you judge yourself and the scriptures paul says i don't even judge myself you judge yourself you bless your own heart you bless your own heart 
Come on, JL said, I tell my girls this exact thing all the time. Lord, give me the strength to align my thoughts with you when it seems difficult to do so. Come on. You judge yourself. Now, can I be... I'm going to be straight up with you, friends. What's the difference between you lusting after a woman and somebody who rapes her? Just the fact that you didn't do it? Is that is that the difference? What's the difference between you who thought about how you could run in and steal something real quick and the person who did it? Are you are you that much better cuz you cuz you just didn't do it? What's the difference? What's the difference? What makes you so much better? You judge yourself and you say, "Oh, I'm not that bad." Christ says, I say to you, in Matthew 5, he says, I say to you, any who hates his brother is a murderer. How now? Wait a minute, Jesus. How did you take me? What's the difference between you? I'm going to be real honest. What's the difference between you who says all those racist comments in your head? When those, when those people cut you off, you say all those racist comments in your head and you, and, you, and you talk about them like filth in your head and the person who goes to a grocery store and shoots all of them. Are you just, are you just that much better? Why do we judge ourselves and say, oh no, I'm good. Yeah, I might, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not that bad. Come on, he knows our hearts. God is not just judging everything you do. He's judging your heart, your motives, your intention. When I say judge, he looks at it and he says, that's good or that's bad. Oh, yes. Come on, Pastor Doug. We definitely going to overcome. You can't. You have to bring it into the light. It's the light that causes darkness to scatter. It's the light that causes darkness to flee. You hide and stuff saying, Lord, please heal it. Lord, well, you know, I don't want nobody else to know about this, but. It's the light that causes it to get to going. You judge yourself. The first barrier that's that's keeping you from changing the way you think is that you 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 don't think you're that bad. You don't think you're that bad. I'm telling you, this lust thing is so deep. You can sit over here and covet after something. And say, oh, oh my gosh, did you see her house on Instagram? I want that lamp. I want that rug. I want that this. I want that that. So much that there's discontentment in your heart. Building and brewing because you keep looking at stuff you feel like you want but you can't have. And what's the difference between you and the person who's on the news saying, and Daquan Jones just broke into the person's house last week, shot him dead, and stole all their stuff. What's the difference? Jail says sin is sin. No sin is worse than the other. That's it. We have to stop judging ourselves because when we judge ourselves and say, no, no, baby, I'm fine. I mean, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not out here raping nobody or murdering anybody. I'm not out here stealing from anybody. I'm not out here doing no crazy stuff. So I'm, I'm good. Don't worry about it. I'm good. Don't worry about me. I bless my own heart. I'm good. It's when we get in that position that you can't repent. How are you going to repent when you think that thinking about stealing is not as bad as stealing? So you don't want to hear it. Which goes to the next point. Remember the scripture. Well, before we go to the next part, because I want to give you a scripture with that. Jesus, uh, a man comes to Jesus and he says, how do I be good like you? And Jesus says, who is good but God? There is none good but God. There is all have fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one. Come on. Come on, Brie. I'm trying to get here. I'm getting here, baby. We on, we trucking it. I told y'all, y'all ain't going to be falling out the window dying like y'all did to Paul. The second barrier is the position that you have towards God. The second barrier that you have is your position towards God. Do you believe in? Like, like, I'm getting ahead of myself, but the scriptures say in Romans, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, He's, he's Lord. When, this is the part, I, I can't remember the scriptures. I'm going off, I'm going off the top of my dome, okay? So don't charge me. I remember the story of David when he slept with Bathsheba. He slept with Bathsheba. And y'all remember that story was low key. It's very trifling. 
David has a best friend. He has a, his best friend is, has a wife named Bathsheba. He sees her baby. He says, I'm king and I want to. He takes her to himself. He knows her, gets her pregnant, gets her husband killed on the front line. Really, really trifling story. And in the Psalms, after David discovers and recognizes just the depth of the sin he did, do you know what he says? He says, God, I have sinned against none but you. Huh? You sinned against Bathsheba. You sinned against the people of Israel, didn't you? The people of Jerusalem. You sinned against that poor man that you didn't want to kill. No, no, no. David says, I, Lord, I've sinned against none but you. I've sinned against none but you. Why? Because God is his Lord. That is the per Lord. When he speaks, it is law. People fight about, do you have to observe this and observe that? When God talks, it's law. When he speaks to you by his spirit and he says, stop, that's a law, baby. That's not, that's not a recommendation. That's not a, that's not a, 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 a push in the right direction. He's Lord. We harp so much in the gospel that Jesus Christ is your savior. He saved you to Lord over you. He is your Lord. You serve him. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord. And sometimes we are too light on that. There have been so many times where I've had to change the way I thought about something because the Holy Spirit will say, be, be, uh, be peaceful with your husband. And I'll be like, I don't feel like it. Come on, come on, Dakota. It's not a democracy. I say, I don't feel like it. Now tell me something. The United States ain't even a kingdom. We're a democracy. Would you tell your president, I don't feel like it. I don't want to do that. He's Lord. Yes, he's your friend. Yes, he's your brother. Yes, he's your savior. But the declaration in your heart that gets you saved is not that he's just the savior. That's not. In Romans, it says, if a man believeth in his heart and confesseth with his mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. In our hearts, we have to change our position towards God. Because if we're honest with ourselves, it is the low estimation of God that some of us have that has kept us from shifting all these other times. It is the low estimation that we have of God and, 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 this, and his lordship and his kingship. I'm sorry, did I step on toes? I'm sorry. That gets us to this place where we don't have to move because who's? I, it's just, I don't have to. Come on, Jason, pick up the cross. I'm so serious. Jesus is your Lord. You need to change the position of your heart, the Lord, because he's the Lord. That's when we can start sacrificing. You're going to sacrifice for the Lord. With your friend, it might be a conversation. With, with Savior, you think he lived, died, rose again, and that's the end of the story. No, he's the Lord. Every Like, like the Lord. Yes, we can be honest with him and say, I don't want to do this. Lord, I'm scared to do this. Lord, but at the end of that conversation, it needs to be a yes, sir. Because he's the Lord. We have to change the position in our heart. I'll give you an example in Acts 2. In Acts 2, which is the first Holy Ghost field sermon given by the apostle, Apostle Peter. He gives this whole sermon. And at the end of it, he talks about how Jesus Christ is the one they prophesied about. And you Jewish people killed him. It says their hearts were pricked. Their hearts were pricked. Like it was like, ooh, that's me. It's because of the position. It's because of the position that Peter revealed to them that Christ was in. He said, y'all didn't kill just some random innocent man. You killed the living son of God. And they said, ooh, the Lord. Remember when Jesus Christ, the whole time in the Bible, telling people, don't tell them that they know me. Don't, don't, don't spread my name around. Don't tell them, don't tell them. I said, Lord, that's so strange. When he gets on the cross, he says, it is finished. There's an earthquake. The moon, the sun goes dark. And then the Roman soldier says, oh, wow, he really is the son of God. Oh, yeah, but he's the Lord. Okay. I'm sorry. I might have gotten a little zealous about that. So we have to, not only do we have to change the position that we have with ourselves, we have to change the position that we have with God. We can't keep sidestepping like he's not the Lord. 
If God told you to put the blunt down, put it down. If God told you to come out of that situation, you come out. And if you can't get out, if it's hard every day, you have to say, Lord, look at me. I'm pulling myself by my kneecaps. Lord, help me. I'm dragging myself. Lord, did you see me? When I wanted to watch that pornography, I started praying and I still fell. But, but baby, I'm trying because I know you're the Lord. Lord, I'm trying. Lord, I'm pushing. Lord, I'm. what did you say, Holy Spirit? Oh my gosh, that's so scary. But I'm just going to go scared. He's the Lord. And if you don't realize that now, I'm sorry to tell you, you're going to definitely realize it at judgment day. It's going to be feeling real Lordish up in there. Real Lordish. It's going to be feeling real savorish when we come on the other side, but it's going to be feeling real Lordish on judgment day. I'm just saying. Okay. The last one is we have to change our position with the kingdom of darkness. We have to change the way we think about the kingdom of darkness. We have to change the way we think about ourselves. We have to change the way we think about God. And we have to change the way we think about the kingdom of darkness. We have to change it. And I have the perfect example for what happens when you don't. Exodus, girl. Exodus. The Hebrews. I'm going to summarize it because it's really, I have tons of scriptures. Come on. Remember, we told this story a little bit the last time. The Israelites or the uh, God tells Abraham that his children, the nation that he's birthing in him are going to be slaves for 400 years in a foreign land. So Jacob has some sons. He has 12 sons. They have all these babies. They're all, they grow to a large number and they are all enslaved in Egypt. They become slaves. You know, Prince of Egypt. That's a really great movie if you haven't seen it. They're all enslaved. God sends Moses, let my people go. Moses goes and draws the people out. Now, if you read all of Exodus, what you will see is a people who can't change the way that they think. Because they don't want to let go with the position, the relationship, the way they feel about their bondage. Now, I want to remind you, first of all, God did not just go there because he wanted to. Those people were crying out. The Bible says they were groaning under their bondage. And do you know the image that I'm seeing in my head? Someone who's doing drugs, someone who's addicted to pornography, someone who has has perverted desires. I see all these different scenarios and these people are groaning in their bondage. They're saying, God, I don't I don't want to pick up another needle. God, I don't I don't want to look at another another woman like that. I don't I don't want these thoughts. I don't want it to be this way. I don't want it. I don't want to do it. I don't want it. That's how the Israelites, the Hebrews were groaning in their bondage. Somebody help me. I can't do it another day. I can't. I don't want it. So God sends Moses to help them come out. He goes before Pharaoh, does all these miracles according to the power of God, and they come out and they start walking. And then all of a sudden they say, man, did you bring us out here to kill us? I really miss when we used to have quail with green onions and, and liver and, oh my gosh, my, I just, oh, I miss that taste. Oh, I miss that taste. And so God says, I'll give you manna from heaven. It's like bread. Manna literally means, what is this? It's, I mean, what is this? God, we asked for bread. You, uh, we asked for quail. You gave us bread. Okay. Then they keep walking and say, dang, we thirsty. Did you bring us out here to kill us? We should have stayed in Egypt for all of this. Is this what you brought me out for? For us to die of thirst out here? Is that what you did? God says, Moses, throw, throw your staff into the water because the water is bitter. Throw your staff in there. I'll make it drinkable. Let them drink. Do y'all know they kept doing that over and over again? Over and over. Man, I really miss quail. We should have stayed back in Egypt for all of this. Come on, Defiance. We're thirsty. Did you bring us out here to kill us? We should have stayed back in Egypt for this. So what we see is a people who can't change their mind about their bondage. Either you want it 
or you don't. The way my mama used to say it is, oh, you're not sick and tired yet. There'll be a day when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired. And that when that day comes, when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, you'll make a change. Mm -hmm. Either you want it. Come on, that's exactly the word, Miss Joe. Stiff-necked. That's what God called them. You stiff-necked people. Lord, forgive us. Lord, forgive me for sure. We start to glamorize what we've grown to come out of. I remember I used to smoke. I used to smoke. I had a very high temper and I used to smoke. And I remember when I first, I gave it up. I said, God, I, oh, thank you, Jesus. I don't want to have to depend on this anymore. Oh. And he took it. And then the first thing, first time something stressed me out, I immediately was like, dang, God, you ain't going to come for me or something? Like, I mean, golly, I could have been smoking for all of this. You going to give me this wife who doesn't want to be intimate with me? I could have been watching, I could have been handling this myself for all of this. And so all of a sudden, this darkness that you said you was done with, this darkness that you said you didn't want no more, this darkness that you said, oh, 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 God, oh, please help me, God. It all of a sudden, at the slightest moment that God is not your personal genie, all of a sudden, Egypt looks like heaven. We have to change the way we think about the kingdom of darkness. A lot of us can't come out of sin. Because we refuse to change the way we see the things we did in the dark. We refuse to change the way we feel. Well, I feel like it's just an herb, quite honestly. So, I mean, it's medicinal and God gave us all of this. So, if God gave us the earth and gave us dominion over the herbs, then I should be able to smoke the herb. So, I don't really see what's wrong with it. And when somebody quotes to you and they say, be sober minded, you have all the problems in the world or you have nothing to say at all. They say, girl, been there, but God reminded me of what it was to go back what he took. Come on. <laughs> That's it. You know, you notice in in the Old Testament, there's this, there's this theme. There's this theme. Every time he would bring the Israelites somewhere, he would take them a little bit and he would say, remember, I'm the God that did and then listed everything he did. He would say, remember, I did all of this. Remember, I did all of this. Remember? Why? Because it's so easy for us sometimes to fall back into our old way of thinking, to fall into our old way of thinking about the things we used to do. We forget that Egypt was slavery and all we remember is the meat. Huh? And it's so crazy because when Christ comes and reveals the path back to the kingdom of light and we become children of God, remember turns into rejoice. And there's this theme of rejoicing. You need to rejoice because I already did it. You need to rejoice because I freed you from that stuff. You need to rejoice because I cut off those shackles. You need to rejoice because you are no longer bound to fear. You need to rejoice because you've received my Holy Spirit. You need to rejoice because your name is in the Lamb books of life. It's not about remember anymore. Now it's about rejoice. Why? Because the work is completed. It's done. You want to be free? Guess what? Can I tell y'all something? There have been so many things that I have suffered with. And I know you might not agree with me. And if you don't, lift me up in prayer. There have been so many things I have struggled with. I mean struggled. I mean, I'm talking about hard down struggle. Hard down struggle. Oh my God. Praying, God deliver me. God deliver me. And I remember every, it's happened more than once. The Holy Spirit will come to me and he'll say, do you want to be free? And I say, yes. Come on, Mary. You already then set it up. I said, yes, Lord, I want to be free. And I'm thinking I'm about to have one of these YouTube video experiences that I'm about to start shivering and shaking or I'm about to have a vision or something's about to come floating out of me. Do you know what the Holy Spirit says to me? You're free. I don't, I didn't get any like shivers. I didn't feel nothing shift. I didn't, I, multiple times. Lord, help me. I really am struggling with this. I really am struggling with that. Help me, help me, help me. And you know what the Holy Spirit says? Do you want to be free? Just like he said to the man that was sitting by the waters. He said, do you want to be healed? Be healed. My blood has already paid the price. Rejoice. Now, resist the devil and he'll flee. Flee from temptation. Come on. Come on, Dakota. I was like, where's my fallout? I'm standing at the altar. I'm ready. Where are the ushers at? Y'all going to catch me? Be free. Be free.
we have to turn around. That's it. We have to turn around. The start of a shift is sacrifice. And the biggest sacrifice you will ever make is to change the way you think. Sacrifice the way you think. Sacrifice it. Because the rest of the world lives in it delightedly. Come on, it's not about feelings, but believing. That's it. I'm waiting for a feeling. And he said, okay, well, be free. Believe that you're free and walk in it. Walk in your healing. What does that mean? What? Be healed. What? Huh? Go. We have to turn around. Jesus Christ is literally a path from the kingdom of darkness to light that nobody can see. Come on, Pastor Dale, when you don't feel it, you faith it. And do you know what? All those instances where I was asking God to free me, I'm free, y'all. I'm free. Does that mean I don't, I, I, I don't mess up? No. There's sometimes where I stop walking in the spirit and I start walking in the flesh. There are sometimes that happens. And I, and I say, Lord, what about my thinking? What, what, what caused me to, did I forget that you were Lord? Did I bless my own heart and say, oh, I, that's not a problem for me. What is it? We have to turn around to change the way we think. That's all it means. Repentance is just turning around. Turning around. That's it. And once you turn around, then you'll be able to see a path that you didn't even know was there. And you're in the kingdom of darkness, everybody. It's like, it's like that picture of fish swimming all in one direction and you have the Jesus fish swimming the other way. Everybody in the kingdom of darkness is going the same way. You want to get back to the kingdom of light? Change your position. Turn around. Turn around and change how you, how you think about yourself. Why do you think you're so great? Why do you think you're so much better than everybody else because of their sin and yours isn't as bad? Huh? He did it already. You don't feel it, but it's done. The shift has been made. Come on. Why? Just, just turn around. Why? Why do you think you're so great? Why? Why do you feel like, do you not know that Jesus is your Lord? That comes with trust. Have the capacity to change. That's it. Come on, Jason. Come on, quoting Pastor Doug. Change your capacity. Like change your, change the way you think about God. Like remember that when He's speaking to you, this ain't no, this ain't no friendly nudge. This is the Lord, and change the way that you think about darkness. I'll tell this last thing as a testimony, and I'm done. I remember reading a woman's testimony. Because this, this young girl had just come to Christ and she said, I don't know. I'm fighting between my identity in Christ and my identity with my sexuality. And I'm fighting with it. And I, I know it doesn't go together, but I, I just don't know how to let it go. And this woman responded to her, her plea and she, she gave her testimony. And do you know what stuck out to me? She said, I love him too much to just live in a comfortable space for me. I love him too much. And I know for women, I know there's that one man out there that you loved too much. We're gonna say it's your husband. But, <laughs> I love God too much. We just have to turn. And that sin if we start dealing with our way, the way we think, sin will fall off. If Eve had sacrificed all that she thought, she thought it looks good. It looks like it's good for wisdom. It looks tasty, but I'm laying it down. I sacrifice all that I think to be obedient. If she had just Change, if she just turned around, turned her thinking around, girl, we would be eating naked with grapes and all kinds of stuff. Drew said, just because you don't feel him, don't mean he's not there. God will come to you where you are. All we have to do is choose him. Choose life. Amen. That's it right there. I love y'all so much. Um, we should be having Bible study again next Wednesday. I pray that y'all have patience as you get ready to get your kiddos back off to school. Um... And remember that question, what thinking do you have that causes you to sin against God? 
What thinking, what thoughts do you have? What way of thinking have you taken as truth that causes you to sin against God? That's what I'm going to think about. Come on. Amen. Victory. Come on. Victory. Yay, yay, yay. I love y'all so much. Pastor Doug and Pastor Christy love y'all so much. The Reclaim Church family loves you so much. We're so glad that you are on tonight, and we will see you next week. Love you guys.